When is assassination or targeted killing justified? That question is on our mind because over the last few years, the United States has assassinated or practiced targeted killing against a variety of different enemies. You will probably recall the targeted killing of Osama bin Laden. You will probably recall the targeted killing of General Soleimani earlier this year. Breaking news. In a major escalation in tensions between the U.S. and Iran, the top Iranian general has been killed in an airstrike while leaving the Baghdad airport. The Pentagon confirmed the U.S. military carried out the attack. Qasem Soleimani was one of the most powerful figures in the Middle East and had been the top military man in Iran for more than 20 years. This attack comes after Iranian-backed groups breached the U.S. embassy in Baghdad just two days ago. We now turn to ABC's Kara Phillips, who's with President Trump in West Palm Beach, Florida. Kara. When reports of the airstrike at the Baghdad airport broke tonight, there was one question on everyone's mind. Was the United States responsible? Well, the president was cryptic. He responded with only a picture, tweeting out the image of the American flag. My White House sources were able to confirm that not only did the strike happen, but it was ordered by President Trump, the Pentagon announcing that the strike did indeed kill the powerful commander of Iran's Revolutionary Guard Corps, Qasem Soleimani, as well as the head of an Iranian-backed Iraqi militia. And it was ordered by President Trump. Now, here in the U.S., Republicans are calling this a success, saying Trump made a brave and correct call, but the president is also facing questions from his critics on Capitol Hill, asking if the United States carried out the assassination without authorization from Congress, potentially bringing this country to the brink of an all-out war. Kira, thanks. Joining us now is ABC News Chief Global Affairs Correspondent Martha Raddis. Now, Martha, you were on the ground in, in Iraq with Soleimani not too long ago. What was his presence like there? Well, when, uh, when ISIS was taking over towns in Iraq, Soleimani would often be seen in Iraq traveling back and forth between Iran and Iraq to, to help lead the fight, these Iranian-backed militias against ISIS. He was a very strong but very mysterious presence in Iraq. He was not high profile by any means, but people certainly knew he was there and certainly knew what he was doing in trying to defeat ISIS. But I will also say that his presence was felt throughout the war there because he was responsible for the deaths of many Americans. And I heard soldiers and generals and everyone talk about that and what the Iranians had done and the Iranian weapons uh, that were present in Iraq and targeting American troops. So clearly this is a victory tonight then for the Trump administration. But I would imagine that Iran will have a, a response, yes? I, I think it's almost certain Iran will have some sort of response, uh, even given what we've heard from them this evening in tweets, uh, and that the United States in some way will pay for this. Uh, I think the important thing here to look at in any kind of Iranian response is whether they take credit for it. Remember with the attacks uh, earlier this year on the Saudi oil fields and uh, the, the, the drone attacks, they talked about the drone, but they did not talk about the Saudi oil fields. They did not take responsibility for those attacks. In fact, the foreign minister uh, of Iran told me in person when I was in Tehran uh, that some of those must have been photoshopped, that they weren't responsible for those things. So I think if Iran has some sort of response to the killing of Soleimani and they take credit for it, uh, they are looking for a larger conflict. If they don't, I think they want to tamp this down. Martha Rattis, thank you so much. Joining us now is ABC News military contributor Colonel Steve Ganyard. He's a former Marine and high-ranking State Department official. Steve, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us. First, what, what's the latest? What's the information you have at this hour? 
we know everything that uh, that is out in the public, and that is that the Soleimani is dead, along with the head of this uh, of this militia group that uh, that Iran uh, that Iran controlled. And so uh, that is the headline. That's not going to change uh, overnight. What may change overnight is how the Iranians react. Uh, obviously, this is something that uh, that they'll have to do something about. Uh, Mr. Soleimani is uh, he is not just a general; he is something almost a demigod uh, within the eyes of the Iranian people. He has um, been a hero of the Iranian people for a long time. He is their face uh, overseas in their international adventures, uh, and so this is not just some general. This is somebody who is not only one of the most powerful men in Iran, but one of the most powerful men in all of the Middle East. So it seems that you would suggest that Iran will almost certainly have to respond. They're going to have to do something. I think that, that what they do and how much they do is up to them. The, the administration did two things that were very interesting uh, today. One is that they said, we will hold Iran responsible for anything that happens. That means no surrogates, no Hezbollah, no uh, tankers in the Gulf just mysteriously blowing up, no global hawks being shot down, anything that happens. Iran will be held responsible by the U.S. So they no longer have the ability to hide behind their proxies, to hide behind their surrogates. So uh, what they do will be up to them, but they know that if they get held responsible, uh, that the U.S. very quickly could defeat their, their conventional military and leave them helpless. That's the real risk here, is that it gets, turns into something that, that becomes a very uh, uh, dangerous conventional fight within the Persian Gulf. Based on what you just said, how <clears throat> likely is it at this point that more U.S. troops will be sent to the region? Uh, I think the, the posture that we have there is quite strong. Uh, it's certainly enough to deal with anything that the uh, Iranian military could throw at the U.S. Uh, it just depends on what kind of response comes from it. If the Iranians decide to do something quiet, to hit back just to show that they did, uh, then it'll be probably something that the troops there will be able to handle. The real danger here is does it get out of hand? Do the Iranians respond, try to deflect uh, the anger that is inherent in the Iranian people towards the Iranian regime? As you know, that there have been riots over the past uh, few months. Thousands of Iranians have been killed by Iranian security forces in these riots. And so the Iranian regime wants to deflect that anger onto the U.S. So that is sort of going to be part of the calculus on how hard they hit back at the U.S. Colonel Steve Ganyer, thank you so much. The attack tonight killing the top general in Iran is just the latest in a troubled relationship between the U.S. and Iran, one that's been ongoing for 40 years since the regime took American hostages. But last summer, tensions began to increase once again. The U.S. calling the strike a success for the Iranians, almost surely a call for retaliation. Iranian television announcing his death, saying Soleimani had been martyred after years of struggle for Islam. The Department of Defense confirming the attack, saying it was done, quote, at the direction of the president, adding this strike was aimed at deterring future Iranian attack plans. The attack came after continuing tension between the U.S. and Iran. In 2018, President Trump pulled out of the Iran nuclear deal brokered by President Obama. This was a horrible one-sided deal. Just days ago on New Year's Eve. Do I want to know? I want to have peace. I like peace. And Iran should want peace more than anybody. So I don't see that happening. In April, the U.S. State Department made the unprecedented step of labeling the Iranian National Guard a terrorist organization. This historic step will divide the world's leading state sponsor of terror the financial means to spread misery and death around the world. By early May, the U.S. aircraft carrier had been deployed to the region. Then, a shocking escalation, a series of attacks on international oil tankers in the region's busy shipping channels. Smoke billowed hundreds of feet high from one of the crippled oil tankers. The tit for tat all leading up to a June 2019 attack on a U.S. drone. The Pentagon claims it was flying in international airspace, but Iran maintains the drone was in their territory. The Pentagon readies an airstrike, only to see a stunning reverse in course around 7 p.m. The U.S. military ready to launch warplanes and warships at Iranian targets, until one final meeting between the president and members of his national security team. Where Trump made a dramatic reversal against the advice, sources say, of former national security advisor John Bolton. And Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. But he later told NBC News he changed his mind because the planned strikes were not proportionate to Iran's downing of an unmanned U.S. drone. I thought about it for a second. I said, you know what? They shot down an unmanned 
uh, drone, and here we are sitting with 150 dead people that would have taken place probably within a half an hour after I said go ahead. Yeah. The president denying reports that planes were in the air and ships were in positions before he called off that strike. But that was not the case tonight. As Iran buried its top nuclear scientist this morning, assassinated in his car by a hit team outside Tehran last Friday, there are vows for revenge and claims the weapons, including a remotely operated machine gun, came from Israel. Iran's president, Hassan Rouhani, said his nation would respond to this criminal action at the right time. The supreme leader said punishment would be definitive, but gave no details. While Israel has said nothing, the scientist Mohsen Fakhrizadeh has long been at the top of the Mossad's hit list, Israel considering him to be the country's Oppenheimer, working to build nuclear weapons, a goal Iran denies. Israel's is prime minister Muslim singled out Fakhrizadeh two years ago. Put it. Remember that name, Fakhrizadeh. Former chairman of the Joint President Chiefs, Biden. Admiral Mike Mullen, saying this on Meet the Press. Fakhrizadeh was at the heart of the Iranian nuclear program and has been for years. Not only the brains, but also the passion behind it. So uh, his assassination is really a significant event. U.S. and Israeli intelligence work closely together. And just last week, media reports in both countries, unconfirmed by NBC News, said the U.S. and Israel were planning covert actions against Iran before the Trump administration runs out. I'm actually very concerned about the Trump loyalists who have now gone to work in the Pentagon. It's pretty difficult to think that over the course of 50 or 60 days, you can do something constructive, but you can do something that's really destructive. As new concerns are on the rise about what Trump will do in his final days as commander in chief, at the very least, the assassination makes President-elect Biden's goal of reviving negotiations with Iran much harder. I'm hopeful that that President like Biden can actually reach in and calm the waters, but I think this heightens tension significantly. Savannah, media reports in Iran say that the assassins used that remotely operated machine gun, which was hidden in the back of a pickup truck. We've just watched a couple of news clips about recent targeted killings. One was General Soleimani, in the early part of this year, and then more recently, the, um, the assassination of the Iranian nuclear scientist. We're gonna be reading about some of the ethical issues around the killing of um, scientists and, and uh, foreign uh, soldiers and leaders in uh, especially the Waldron essay and the Mizell's essay, which I'm going to be talking about in more detail on the PowerPoints. But it's important that we recognize that targeted killing is not something that's new. It, it has been a feature of um, modern history. And some targeted killing seems, on the face of it at least, justified. Perhaps the strongest arguments that are made in favor of targeted killing are those that uh, address the killing of someone who is obviously uh, a fiend, uh, a barbaric um, ruler or leader. And one of the most important cases here is the killing of the Nazi uh, governor of uh, the Czech, Czechoslovakia, Reinhard Heydrich. So I'd like to watch a, a clip about Reinhard Heydrich, who I think provides us with another example. And then we will conclude with a somewhat more um, easier case, that of the killing of Admiral Yamamoto in the Second World War. So watch these clips. And again, we're trying to build up a set of cases that we can use to apply our, our moral and ethical theories to. So here come two more clips. The Czech government in exile, led by Edward Benesh, aided by his former head of Czech intelligence, Brantisek Moravec, had identified Heydrich. 
as a potential target for assassination. But Nesh had decided that some kind of operation was necessary as the Czech government in exile was not officially recognized by the British. Therefore, he wanted to undertake a major operation against the Nazi regime in Czechoslovakia in order to gain greater diplomatic leverage so that Czechoslovakia would be reformed as a nation after the war. To achieve this goal, and with the British government's approval, Czech soldiers were specially chosen and were then put through a rigorous training regime to prepare them to be dropped behind enemy lines into Czechoslovakia in an operation codenamed Anthropoid. Two men named Jan Kubisch and Joseph Gabček were then chosen to carry out the operation and were then along with their commandos dropped into Czechoslovakia in December of 1941 in a British Halifax bomber. But as was often the case, none of the operatives were dropped in the correct location. Bakuvish and Gabčik were luckily found by Czech resistance members who smuggled them into Prague where they would then spend the following months being transferred back and forth between various safe houses. The British had equipped the operatives with collapsible submachine guns known as Sten guns, which could be dismantled and hidden with ease, as well as grenades which were designed to explode on contact after being thrown. Fortunately for Kubish and Gabcik, Heydrich, despite living off the capital of an occupied country, had maintained his casual attitude to his personal security, as he would often drive from his villa in the suburbs of Prague into the city centre and his headquarters at Prague Castle in an open top Mercedes with only his driver to protect him. Himmler had visited Prague in April of 1942 and was appalled by Heydrich's disregard for his own safety, but thankfully for the Czechs, Heydrich continued to display his characteristic arrogance and ignored Himmler's orders to travel with an armed escort. After spending several weeks studying Heydrich's daily routine, as well as the route Heydrich took into Prague, Kubisch and Gabcik then chose the spot to carry out their attack. The location was a wide bend in the road where Kubisch, Gabcik, and along with a third agent, Joseph Valchik, would attack Heydrich's car as it slowed down. Word then reached them that Heydrich was due to leave the city for Berlin to meet Hitler, and possibly would be reassigned to Paris to subdue the growing resistance movements there. The decision was then made to carry out Operation Anthropoid before Heydrich left Prague for Berlin. The three men then took up their positions on the morning of the 27th of May 1942 with Valchik positioned before the bend in the road with a mirror with which he would signal his comrades when he saw Heydrich's car approaching. Kubisch and Gabcik were positioned on the bend in the road near a tram stop where they could wait without arousing suspicion. Then, shortly after 10.30 a.m., Heydrich left his villa and drove along his usual route but was later than usual as he had spent time with his family that morning before leaving the country. As he approached the Czech commandos, Valchik signalled his comrades to prepare themselves and as Heydrich and his driver then rounded the corner, they were confronted by Gabcik who stepped into the road, pulled out his submachine gun, aimed at Heydrich and pulled the trigger, but the gun jammed. Heydrich then made another fatal mistake and ordered his driver to stop the car, after which he then stood up and went for his pistol. Kubisch then threw a contact grenade towards the car, attempted to land it inside the vehicle but missed, and then it exploded, sending shrapnel into Heydrich's side. The Czech agents then fled the scene, being chased by Heydrich's driver, but Heydrich himself then slumped to the floor, holding his side which was now bleeding profusely. He was then rushed to hospital in the back of a delivery van where the doctors tried but failed to remove the dozens of grenade fragments from his body. He initially seemed to be making a good recovery, but whilst eating lunch a week after the attack, he collapsed, went into a coma, and then died early in the morning of the 4th of June, 1942, aged 38. An autopsy concluded that he had died of sepsis possibly caused by the horsehair stuffing of the seats in his car entering his body. Given the relatively primitive medical technology of the time, the exact causes of death are not known for certain. His attackers then went into hiding after the incident, but were then later betrayed by one of their comrades who revealed the locations of a number of resistance safe houses where they had been given shelter. The son of one of the owners of the safe houses then revealed after being presented with his mother's severed head that Heydrich's assassins were hiding in the St. Cyril Cathedral in Prague. 
Gestapo and SS troops then surrounded the cathedral, and after a gun battle, all of the Czech agents inside, including Kubisch and Gabchik, shot themselves to avoid capture. Hitler and his Nazi hierarchy were incandescent with rage at Heydrich's assassination, and ordered severe and brutal reprisals to be carried out as revenge for his death, and it is still debated to this day as whether the Nazi reprisals made the assassination of Reinhard Heydrich worthwhile. Yes, the supreme Japanese naval commander, Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto, mastermind of the dastardly sneak attack on Pearl Harbor, gunned from the skies of the South Pacific by these Army Air Corps flyers. These brave sky fighters of the 339th, 70th, and 12th fighter squadrons realized that they and their lightnings wrote a chapter that history may regard as the turning point of this war. April 18th, 1943, while evading attacks from escorting Zeros, Captain Tom Lanfear, Lieutenant Besby Holmes, and Lieutenant Rex Barber brought down two bombers transporting Yamamoto and his staff. Days earlier, an alert radio operator intercepts the secret message listing Yamamoto's flight schedule to the Bougainville airfield, 435 miles north of Guadalcanal. The code cracked. The Admiral has no chance of making it. No chance, thanks to our boys, ready to give their lives in the perils of the sky. Major John Mitchell plans the daring mission. He has to have these men over Bougainville at the precise moment Yamamoto is to arrive. Mitchell knows that the Admiral is a very punctual man. Since timing is very critical, he will navigate only by compass and clock. No one knows how many fighters will be waiting for them. Sure, you'd be nervous too. No rationing here, fellas. They'll need plenty of that precious stuff for the 900-mile round trip. head out from Guadalcanal that morning. Twelve planes will take care of any enemy fighters, and four lightnings will smash Yamamoto's bombers. Two hours later, and only a minute off schedule, the pilots make landfall. There it is, and there's the target. Lanfear and Rex Barber head in for Yamamoto. The Japanese learn that Yankee lightning strikes hard and fast. Once on his tail, Lieutenant Barber keeps to his gun. Look at this spectacle. Barber relentlessly hammers the bomber into the jungle. A fiery end. Japan's greatest military mind. Thanks to these brave warriors, that 18th day of April brings our forces a day closer to victory.